Welcome to Legendary Motivation Channel. Join us as we listen to some of Neville Goddard's greatest lectures, books, and radio talks, which might never been recorded or released on the internet before, until now. Today we present his remarkable book, This Is My Name, Forever I Am. In this video, we've utilized AI-enhanced technology to improve the audio quality, featuring the voice of Neville Goddard. We hope you enjoy the content and kindly support us by liking, subscribing, and sharing your thoughts in the comments below. Sit back and enjoy the masterpiece work of one of American greatest mystics, Neville Goddard. Tonight, let us discuss the name. If you find this name or believe in it, really there is nothing impossible to you. If you really believe in it, Moses said to God, if I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say? The Lord said, I am who I am. Sometimes it is translated, I am what I am, or I am that I am. But any form of the verb, to be. I am who I am. Then he said, say this to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The Lord God, the God of your father Abraham, and Isaac and Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and by this name I shall be known throughout all generations. No change in this name, my name forever. This comes in the book of Exodus, the third chapter, verses 13 to 17. If you read the book of Exodus, you will find that this is sheer power, completely unmodified by any justice, any love, no mercy, no pity, no peace, sheer power. So Moses stands in the presence of power. That's the first revelation of God, and it's I am. May I tell you, when you believe it, that's how you use it. Your first use of it is sheer power unmodified by any mercy in this world, just power. So in this same book of Exodus, he is told to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let his children go free. Then he hardens the heart of Pharaoh. Therefore, he's playing all the parts. He sends his servant Moses to tell Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go free. Then he hardens the heart of Pharaoh. So who is playing all the parts? Since Jehovah, which is I am, is the primary actor in every event, if you adopt this name of God, this is what will happen to you. If you really believe it and adopt it, then the cult of heroic personalities will be unable to take any foothold in your faith. You can't turn to any being in this world as an important person in your life, but no one. You can't point to anyone. This night, a great man is making his exit from the world, and we all admire him as a person. But when you adopt the name of God, the God of Israel, and actually believe in the God of Israel, which is I am, and know he plays all parts, then you cannot really turn to any cult of heroic personalities. You'll find none in Israel, none whatsoever. There's only I am. So the first revelation is sheer power. You can do it and you're invited to do it. So Pharaoh, who was condemned by the world, was hardened by the very one who asked him to set the children of Israel free. So when you see it, you can say at the very end of the drama, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, Luke 23, 34. For God the Father played all the parts. But you don't know he is God the Father in the early stages of the revelation of the name. The name is revealed as sheer power, nothing but power. And then, it unfolds itself and finally comes to the end, and the end is God the Father, and the Father is infinite love. But we don't know that until the very end. So we are told in various and many ways, God spoke to our fathers through his servants, the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through a son. Heb point one, one. Now we know he speaks through a son, then he must be a father. You can't speak through your son unless you are a father, and the son reveals the father, Matt 11, 27. But until you reach the point where you see the son and know who God the father is, you are moved to use sheer power. And so 
you are invited to use power. So, may I tell you how to use it? The name is simply I Am. It's not Neville, it's not John Brown, it's not Mary Smith, it's not any name outside of I Am. That's God and it is infinite might. You could this night seated here close your eyes to the obvious and dare to assume that you are now the one that you desire to be and assume that you are it. Don't ask how. This is a power, sheer power. And in a way that no one knows this assumption would rearrange the entire structure of your world and mirror the fulfillment of that assumption. You could this very moment assume that you are elsewhere, though you are here and you have no means of getting there. And suddenly, if you dare to assume it, believing in the name, the only name the God of Israel possesses, I am. If you dare to assume it, then a bridge of incidents would form itself across which you would be compelled to move. You would move across this bridge of events leading up to the fulfillment of your assumption if you believe in the name of the God of Israel. You never leave Egypt until you accept the God of Israel. No one leaves it. Everyone is in Egypt. Everyone is buried in a coffin, as told us so beautifully in the seed plot of the Bible, which is Genesis. In the beginning, God. It begins and the Bible ends. That is, the book of Genesis, Ari Kothan Bais, in a coffin in Egypt. Genesis 1 to 1, 50, 26. And who is put into a coffin in Egypt? Joseph the dreamer. Well, who is the dreamer? Aren't you a dreamer? Behold, this dreamer cometh. Joseph, the prototype of the fulfillment of God's purpose. Genesis 37, 19. He said, you meant it for evil. You meant it to be evil to me, but God meant it for good. Gender 50, 20. So God played both parts. He made you sell me into Egypt, and yet he did it for a purpose, that I would show the whole vast world who God is. He's the dreamer. The dreamer in man is God. When you say, I am, that's God. The Bible recognizes only one source of dreams. All dreams, all visions proceed from God, Numer 12 and 6, Job 33, 15. So as I stand here, I can dream a daydream or I can close my eyes and fall into a little nap and have an uncontrolled night dream. Or I can open my eyes up on the world and ignore the entire world and have a controlled daydream. Still the same dream. This is the power that is God, which is I am. So if you accept the God of Israel, you begin to move out of Egypt. That is the beginning of the Exodus. But man has great trouble in keeping the tense. He's always turning here, turning there, turning elsewhere. He can't seem to be faithful to the tense. The tense is, I am. If I say thou art, I'm away. If I say he is, I'm away. If I use the word Lord and think of something else than I am, I'm away. If I use any name used in scripture for God and do not allow it to register in me as I am, I'm completely away. So the yod heh vav which is the Lord in scripture, which means I am, it is the verb to be, but it has no sound. There are four consonants and no one can really sound it. My old friend Ab tried to explain to me how to sound it, but he couldn't sound it. You can't sound yod, heh vav he in Hebrew. There's no way to sound it. But we have added something to it and tried to give it a sound. We call it Jehovah. Some call it Yahweh. But you can't sound the name. It's the unpronounceable name, this power that is, I am. If you always remember that when they use the word Adonai, they use the word Adonai for the saying, Yod, He, Vau, He. Because they can't sound Yod, He, Vau, He, they say Adonai. Sometimes they use another word, Aleph, Lamed and they will use many words. But no matter what word you hear for God, you can always remember it is I am and no one else. Then you can't go wrong. All things are possible to God. If a man can stand before a board and simply see on that board what he wants to see, which if he saw it would imply that he owned the building, well, who's looking at it? I am. Well, what are you seeing? 
I am seeing and I tell him exactly what I am seeing. Well, if I am seeing it, it would imply I own the entire block and that's all that I do. So I am doing it and two years later without a nickel in the pocket, I owned the block. And this is true. I'm not manufacturing this. I'm telling you a true story. That building was bought in 1924 for $50,000 and he didn't have a penny in his pocket. He sold it this past year for $840,000 and there is no tax on capital gain. That is the man who is my second brother, who is simply looking and simply using God's only name, which is I am. This is sheer power when it first reveals itself to man. So we go forward condemning Pharaoh. Why condemn Pharaoh when the being who plays Pharaoh plays the part of Moses? He's playing all of the parts in the world, but every part after you use it. And quite often, unwisely, unlovingly, unmercifully, still in the end, there is no condemnation. You're moving towards a predetermined end to find that God is Father and infinite love is God. But tonight, I share with you my own knowledge and use of this name in power. I can also share with you, and I will, this name in its final state in love. For when you come to the very end of the unfolding of the name, you are God. So you start in the beginning, and so you are told. I have tried you in the furnaces of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. Is Isdio 48, 8, 10. God alone is praise unto God. Spirit alone is praise unto spirit. Life alone is praise unto life. So if I would receive the praise, the glory of God, I must become God first. And so here are the words in the 17th of John. Father, glorify thy son that the son may glorify thee. Verse one. The son can't glorify the father until the father first glorifies the son. Now he makes the statement. I have accomplished all the works thou gavest me to do. Now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory I had with thee before that the world was. Verse 4. Well, who is asking this question? You and I, when we have finished the work. When we've accomplished all of the work given us to do, we only ask for the return of the glory that we gave up to assume the limitation of flesh. For the one that is asking is the creative power and wisdom of God personified as man. So to come here, we came with a purpose and to come here, we were the creative power and the wisdom of God. For that's who Christ is, as told us in the book of Corinthians, first chapter of first Corinthians, Jesus Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, verse 24. And so here personified as man. But when he's completed the work, which is the unfolding of the name of God, when it comes to the very end and he nati as God the Father. Now I've accomplished the work thou gavest me to do. Now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory that I had with thee before that the world was. And so God glorifies the Son, that the Son may glorify the Father, because the Father alone is glory unto the Father. So you can't really glorify the Father until the Father first glorifies you. And he doesn't glorify you until you come to the very end. When you return, that creative power has returned from its mission. Having accomplished all that it was sent to do, it comes back and then it returns. And the Father glorifies it first, that it in turn will glorify the Father. So this is the great mystery of this name. So in the book of Exodus, when Moses begins to sing the song called the Song of Moses, he said, God is a man of war. The Lord is his name. 15.3, only power, sheer power. God is a man of war. For he saw it, every child died. That was the first child from he who sat on the throne to the one who was in the dungeon. Go and ask him to let my people go, but I will harden his heart. And then you tell him that every firstborn this night will die from Pharaoh's firstborn to the lowest in the land of Egypt. 
And that night they all died, and the firstborn of the cattle died. They said, We are dead men. Let these people go. Well, who did it? Was it not the same God? Only one God plays all the parts in the world. There's nothing but God. God is playing every part. But now, if you want to really start the exit from the world of death, you must accept the name of the God of Israel. This is monotheism in the extreme. You can't have two gods and be a true Israelite, and only the Israelite comes out of Egypt. As told us, truly thou hast been good, the pure in heart. The 73rd chapter of the book of Psalms, verse 1. Then he looks and he sees Nathan, who was called Nathaniel, the gift of God. And he said, Behold the Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile, John 1, 47, no two gods, just one God. So he calls Israel. He only calls Israel a man after his own heart, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. And he calls him. Well, if there is no guile, then you are only worshiping one God. But to worship means worthy of one's attention. So you pay attention to the headlines tomorrow morning. You pay attention to something else tomorrow. Are you paying any attention to I am? Would you spend five minutes tonight before you go to bed or five minutes tomorrow just to contemplate being just being, not John, not Mary, not anyone in this world, simply being, for that is to worship God. So you worship only I am. So you dwell upon just being. You'd be amazed what you will see and what will happen as you dwell upon being. You've never seen such glorious light as you dwell just upon being. This golden, golden light begins to appear all around you, liquid light. As we are told in the Book of Wisdom, like gold in the furnace, he has tried us and received us unto himself as pure gold. Proverbs 4, 9, 17, and 3. That's right, molten gold. You are tried in the furnace, and all of a sudden you turn into molten gold. And he receives you unto himself as pure molten gold. Then you leave this world called the world of Egypt, which is the coffin. So then he was placed in the coffin in Egypt. The very last verse in the book, the 50th chapter of the book of Genesis. And he was put into a coffin in Egypt. Verse 26. But he exacted a pledge from his brothers that he would not be left in Egypt. They would take him out of Egypt and bring him into the land that was promised. So... The whole vast world could be almost within that little statement. In the beginning, God, in a coffin in Egypt. And then the dreamer is dreaming this fantastic dream of life. All must dream the dream of life, but he will come out of it when he discovers the name of God. The first discovery of the name is sheer might, sheer power. I saw it so clearly when I was a lad in my 20s taken into the divine society, and the first one I encountered was infinite might, sheer might, not a shred of mercy in his presence, no peace, no love. But in the same society was infinite love who embraced me, and at that moment of the embrace, I became one with him, fused with infinite love that is the ultimate God. Then I was sent back before the first one, sheer might. I had to start there. It was Might who commanded me to go into the world and tell the story. It wasn't love. Love embraced me, and while mingled with love, I was brought before Might for the second time, and Might sent me into the world with this ringing command in my ears, time to act. That was the word, with emphasis on act. God only acts and is in all existing beings, or men. So let us to him who only is give decision. Blake Marr, Heaven and Hell, Plot 15, he only acts. I started in that manner, trying to test it, and it worked like a charm. Then from then on, the name itself began to unfold into higher levels. Always might, but from the higher and higher levels, until you finally reach the ultimate, and the ultimate is love. God is infinite love, and God is Father. But you will never know the Father save through the Son. 
so the Son reveals you to yourself. When God's only begotten Son stands before you, and you know that He is your Son, then you know who you are. You are the Father. So can't you see in this affirmation, I am, this strange, wonderful unity of God and man? That is my name forever. When I say I am and you say I am, well, isn't this a strange, wonderful revelation of the unity of man and the oneness with God? Then we understand that greatest of all statements when asked what is the greatest of all commandments. And he answered, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Do it on 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the word translated, the Lord is I am. The word Elohim would be the I am's. It's God's. It's plural. Then comes again, the Lord I am is one. So here is a compound unity, one made up of others. So all of us together form the one Lord that is the God of Israel. So no one departs from this fabulous world of death until he first accepts the God of Israel, which is I am. Then he starts. He may make numberless mistakes. As you're told, in the journey they turned back, they made every effort to go back into Egypt because they forgot the tents. They couldn't quite remain faithful to the tents, which is I am. So they brought in Wobohu, they built a golden calf, and they built something else. They made something else. All in conflict with the second commandment. Make no graven image unto me. Do, do six, eight. Well, the graven image need not be something physical. It could be an idea. I met a wonderful person, they will tell you. Come and hear him. Come and hear her. Oh, he's so altogether near God. So you forget I am and you go to he is. That's not God. It's not out there at all. God does not wear the name called Neville or John Brown. These are masks. Forget them. It's simply I am. So wherever you are in this world, whatever you're doing, if you could only remember the name of God and call upon it, instantly you would be redeemed from whatever you are if you call upon it in another state. He said, I am the Lord. Rightly translated, it would be, I am the I am. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And besides me, there is no Savior. I know not any. I know no other Savior. I am the first and I am the last, and there is none beside me. Read it in the book of Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, the 41st, the 44th. Is 43, 3, 11, 44, 6, 41, 4. Tie them together and see this wonderful revelation of the name of God who is the Savior of the world. So tonight, instead of praying to someone, may I tell you, if the name of the God I worship is I am, then it follows only what I am. Can I pray aright? I can't pray aright in any other way other than by what I am. He doesn't hear my words. There's a little story told that Michael turned to the Lord and said, Allow me, sire, but I think you've made a great mistake in permitting man to learn how to talk. All of the prayers were coming up and it sounded just like Babel. Everyone was asking something entirely different. All were asking. So he said, if you did not allow them to talk, we could then understand what they were praying for. God said to him, I never listen to what they say. I listen only to their lives. That's all. I listen only to their lives. So only what I am is answered. No prayer of mine goes beyond the roof, but the prayer of what I am. That's all that I can answer. So this night, if I would be healthy, I must assume that I am. If I would be wealthy, I must assume that I am. Don't ask anyone in this world for permission. If I would be anything, I must assume that I am. For that is asking in the only name that really responds. I only listen to their lives. And my assumption need not be based upon the evidence of my senses. It need not be based upon reason. My assumption at that very moment that I assume it will actually build a wonderful series of events. And then I, standing here, will be compelled to walk across this series of events, across that bridge of incidents, and move exactly where the assumption leads me. I have done it time and time again. 
When things seemed so black, I couldn't turn for light. I didn't know where to turn. Had no money, had none of this, none of that, and I dared to assume that I was the man that I wanted to be, and I was where I wanted to be, which would have taken quite a fortune. And strangely enough, it all came out of the nowhere. I didn't have to put my hand in the pocket of another to get it. I did nothing of which I was ashamed to get it. It just happened. But on reflection, one is inclined through past training to believe it would have happened anyway, and that's when you go back to another God and forget the God of Israel. One must ever remember the God of Israel, and the God of Israel is your own wonderful human imagination. That's the God of Israel. That's the God that created the whole vast world and brought it into being and sustains it. Not a thing comes into this world unsupported by your own wonderful imaginal act. It does not remain in the world without such support. And when it ceases to receive that support, it vanishes as though it were never present. That is the God of whom I speak. This is the God of Israel, your own wonderful human imagination, which I speak of as I am. That's God. Start this night because you are encouraged to do it. Go back to the book of Exodus. It's sheer power. If you are in business, try it. The day will come you'll move through the entire series and come right up to the fulfillment of it all and find him to be the God of love. Not only the God of love, but Father. So God has to give you in the end himself to receive glory because he cannot receive glory from anyone but himself. So to receive glory from you, he has to give you himself. And he's a father, so he gives you himself as father and in so doing, he gives you his son. Then you see his son and his son calls you father, and you know it. There's no doubt in your mind as to who he is. He is your son. You look into this heavenly face, which is God's only begotten son, Pastu 7, and you know that you are his father and he is your son. Then the drama is over. But the inheritance, which is God himself, cannot be actualized, or is at least not fully realized by you who has had the experience so long as you still wear the garment of flesh. This is a veil of forgetfulness. This is amnesia. This little garment, complete amnesia, when you step into this world and assume the limitations of the garment of flesh. So you play the part, and then you hear from those whom he has sent into the world the real meaning of his name and the power of his name. You take it and you use it. If it proves itself in performance, does it really matter what others think? What do we know in this world better and more thoroughly than that which we have experienced? Do we know anything in this world more thoroughly than what we've experienced? So if I've experienced it, does it really matter what anyone in this world would tell me? I will say to you, you haven't experienced it or you would not tell me that it is wrong. Had you experienced it, you would have agreed with me, and so you haven't experienced it. Wait, you will experience it. After a man has experienced God, it doesn't really matter what the world would say about there is no God. Many of them say there is no God doesn't really matter. They go blindly on not knowing. First, they're going to find him as power. That's when they first find him. When they find him as power, they're going to use him and misuse him. And as they misuse him, who's misusing him? God's misusing him. He's misusing his own name. He hardens Pharaoh's heart and then kills all the firstborn. In one night, they all die. The locusts come and devour all the land. Every plague, one after the other, is the use of power. But in this way, a strange, peculiar misuse of it. Well, that's all right. You're invited to use it and misuse it. Then comes the pain. He puts you through the furnaces. I'll try you in the furnaces of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how shall my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another, is 4810. So he has to bring me into that state that is just like himself before he can give me his glory that I may reflect his glory. He can't possibly give it to me until I become one with him. 
He takes me through all these furnaces, and finally I become molten gold and can be quickly molded into his image. In the twinkle of an eye, that molten gold takes on his image, and then you ascend right up into heaven with God the Father forever and forever. I can share it with you. I can't convince you by words. I can only tell you it starts with the first revelation of the name, and the first revelation is power, sheer, unmerciful power. That's power. He's called a god of war, and this is his name. But after you've gone through it, and you see it, and you've used it, unmercifully, you will come out of it. And you'll use it on a higher level, and a still higher level, and finally you reach the highest level. And it's the level of love, where God is infinite love. And may I tell you, there is no power in the world comparable to God. We speak of this power on this level, but love is greater than all. That's the greatest of all, for it's the ultimate of God that is love. So tonight, you take this wonderful name and you try it. It won't fail you. I promise you, it won't fail you. Just I am. Forget what you've done in this world. Forget what people think that you are. Forget all the little tags people put upon you. Do take off everything and simply dwell on I am. Repeat it to yourself quietly without any audible sound, just I am. You'll be amazed what happens, just I am. Then in that I amness, clothe it with your wish fulfilled. Just try it. I'm telling you what I have experienced. This is not any theory. This is not speculation. This is pure experience. It comes that way in an ultimate bliss. I can't tell anyone in words what it is to reach a state where there is no one but I am. You are infinite being, pulsing liquid light. There's no world, no people, nothing, just I am. It's a state beyond any way that man could describe in words. And so you and I, separate as we are seemingly, in that state we are one. So if you bear his name, as we're told, go and call my daughters from the ends of the earth and call my sons from afar. All those who are called by my name is in 43.6. Aren't you called by his name? Before you say anything in this world, you say, I am, don't you? Well, that's the name. Call my daughters from the ends of the earth and call my sons from afar, all who are called by my name. Well, we're called by the name because I am, you can say I am. If you first are not aware of being, then you can't be aware of being anything. You must first be aware of being by saying I am. Call all my daughters, call all my sons who are called by my name, and let them know that I am the only savior. Besides me, there is no savior. He calls them all, and gives himself to the called. But tonight, if you are now looking for a better job or a job or a change in your social world or your physical world or whatever it is, start with the sheer power of God, which is I am. And then God can conjure anything in this world. All things are possible to God. Then dare to assume that I am and you name it. As you named it, it is that then I am. So what should I say? Just say, I am that I am. When you go to them, just simply say, I am has sent me unto you. That's all that you say. Some will believe you and some will not. That's all that you say. Just say, I am has sent me unto you. For that's my name forever, throughout all generations. X314. So tonight, you just simply assume that I am, and then you name it. The minute that you name it, you put that on it and then affirm it, I am. You say, I am healthy. The word healthy would become that in the sentence, I am. I am wealthy, I am. I am employed, gainfully employed, I am. So that sentence in the middle, gainfully employed, becomes that in the sentence. I am, and you affirm it. Then fall asleep in that statement just as though it were true and test God and see. As you're told, come test me and see. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in thee? 
unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. 2 Corander 13, 5. Jesus Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. 1 Cor 124. It's this power. So you try it this night and see if you do not externalize in your world that which you are affirming as true of yourself. Now let us go into the silence. Q. How would you interpret that when you read it? I was reading it again and I thought, well now, how can this mean me? And I couldn't quite figure it out. A. Well, my dear, I've answered it as clearly as I can. The four senses that go out of Eden. Eden is all within you. The whole vast book is all about you. The whole drama unfolds within your own wonderful human imagination. So as Blake said, man has no body distinct from his soul. That called body is a portion of the soul discerned by the senses, the chief inlets of the soul in this age. Although he used the word five senses in his own wonderful poem, he confines it to four. Every mystic confines it to four senses because the sense of touch and the sense of taste depend upon contact. And he said that's the closed Western gate in man. Man hasn't quite opened up that gate as yet. If he could only open the Western gate, he would look into the immortal worlds, which he said is his task. I rest not from my great task to open the eternal worlds, to open the immortal eyes of man inward into the worlds of thought, into eternity, ever expanding in the bosom of God, the human imagination. Jer, Plot, 5, Lundra 17. But that western gate in man is closed, so these immortal eyes are closed, the immortal senses are closed. But he takes the western gate, which is the sense of touch. That's closed. Q. Neville. Where's that question of call my daughters from the ends of the earth? A. That's from Isaiah. That's from the 41st chapter. And take the 43rd and tie it with it. Call my daughters from the ends of the earth and my sons from afar off. All those who are called by my name. See, there are two Isaiahs. So the second Isaiah begins with the 40th chapter and does not go beyond the 44th chapter from what I quoted this night. Start from the 41st. They're all very short chapters. 41st or 43rd, and both of them put them together. How would you interpret that when you read it? I was reading it again and I thought, well now, how can this mean me? And I couldn't quite figure it out. That's from Isaiah, that's from the 41st chapter, and take the 43rd and tie it with it. Call my daughters from the ends of the earth and my sons from afar off, all those who are called by my name. See, there are two Isaiahs, so the second Isaiah begins with the 40th chapter and does not go beyond the 44th chapter from what I quoted this night. Start from the 41st, they're all very short chapters, 41st or 43rd and both of them put them together. Neville, where's that question of, call my daughters from the ends of the earth? That's from Isaiah, that's from the 41st chapter. And take the 43rd and tie it with it. Call my daughters from the ends of the earth and my sons from afar off, all those who are called by my name. See, there are two Isaiahs. So the second Isaiah begins with the 40th chapter and does not go beyond the 44th chapter from what I quoted this night. Start from the 41st. They're all very short chapters, 41st or 43rd, and both of them put them together. Neville, would you recap a little bit of what you said on Journey Emma 5th, about the first to be sealed? That was Judah. That's the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation and the 144,000 who are sealed, which spells the name of Adam. Aleph, Daleth, Mem is one plus four plus 40. But in Hebrew, when you get the zero after the figure, you could multiply it indefinitely. So Adam really is 144,000. That's the whole will be sealed. Nor one can be lost because everyone is God. There's only God playing all the parts. But Judah is the first one in the 12. Because there were 12. And each 12 had 12. 
well, 12 times 12 is 144. So the first one called to be sealed is Judah, so that he was the fourth of the fourth generation from Abraham, and he was the one who held the scepter, and from him it could never depart. So that was the fourth one and the fourth name of the fourth son. We come through this doorway called the fourth, because the fourth letter is Daleth, and that is the door. But strangely enough, when you start to seal them, Judah comes first in the seventh chapter of Revelation, verse 5. We're all one. There aren't two of us in this world, but man doesn't know it as yet. And there's no condemnation if you don't know it and you think the other fellow is doing something that is wrong as people do it all day long. Every morning's paper, someone goes to the bank and takes what isn't his. And so all day long, he doesn't know the power of God as yet. Perfectly all right. For the being playing, that thief is God. The one who is going to arrest him is God. The one who will guard him in jail, that's God. God plays all the parts in the world. There's nothing but God. There's no room for anyone. There's only a chad, only one. What is the significance of Joseph exacting the promise from his brothers not to leave him in Egypt? Again, in keeping with the promises of the scripture, all the promises must be fulfilled. Joseph is the dreamer. Do not leave me in the coffin, awaken me. As told us in the 44th chapter of the book of Psalms, rouse thyself, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Verse 23. Not another. It is the Lord who is sleeping. He's only a prototype of the dreamer that is God. It is God who imposed upon himself all these limitations. In fact, Tyranny is nothing more than the division of this spiritual substance against itself. God became fragmented. This is the rock that became broken. Now he's gathering every little piece to put it back together. So when it's all brought back together, it's a far greater rock than it was before. So here, we scatter this creative power, and then we bring it back. And each brings back the work allotted it, and it comes back, and all become one once more. And it's a far greater power than it was before. So everyone is playing. That's why when the Bible speaks of incest, well, anyone you know has to be incest if it's all God and you are God. And Reuben went up unto his mother's bed, and we just judge harshly for his going to his mother's bed. And we speak of all these strange things of scripture that we don't understand that the whole vast world would have to be. There isn't one so-called crime known to man that isn't openly discussed in scripture. We have nothing new in the world concerning crime. We speak of genocide. We speak of destroying a whole city. Read scripture. Complete whipping out entirely of a whole being and all its offspring. That's the sheer destructive power. And finally, it moves towards that which we call Christ Jesus when he finds the Father. And here's a revelation of the Father. And when you stand in the presence of the Father, well, I can't describe it. You've never known such love. You can't describe such ecstasy. People talk of love here. Why, it's like living in separate rooms. Suppose you wanted someone passionately in this world and you were barred by steel bars and you couldn't even touch the other. Well, that's more remote. This thing called love of God, you can't conceive of the intimacy of this love. You become one with infinite love, and it is an ecstasy beyond the wildest dream of man, and that's love. The ultimate is love. So the whole vast scattered world is being drawn one by one by one. I will gather you one by one, O people of Israel, is 2712. You aren't gathered in twos or in groups one by one. And when you are called into the presence of infinite love, you stand in the presence of man, and here is love, and love embraces you. Then you know for the first time in eternity what love really means, and you're there forever. Until tomorrow, after the whole drama is over, a new play is written, and a new fragmentation for a still greater expansion of God.